one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of the very God, the begotten not made, being the one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary and was of the Amen. And was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Our scripture this morning is John chapter 7, verse 37 through 53. John chapter 7, beginning at verse 37 to the end of the chapter. And our subject is living water. John 7, beginning at verse 37. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said, Of a truth, this is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. Some said, Shall Christ come out of Galilee? Hath not the scripture said that Christ cometh of the seed of David and out of the town of Bethlehem where David was? So there was a division among the people because of him. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus saith unto them, He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. And every man went unto his own house. Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles, as we mentioned last week, is also called the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Booths. That is the Feast of, it means tents, literally a Feast of Tents. The last time Jesus is mentioned at being at Jerusalem was early in his ministry, as much as three years earlier. Although it's entirely possible that he had been there in the intervening time, it's just that we're not told of those visits. In that earlier visit, as you recall, early in his ministry, he had healed a man by the pool of Bethesda. And then he was accused of being a Sabbath breaker for telling a man to take up his bed and walk. Then he was accused of blasphemy for calling God his father. That was also the visit to Jerusalem when he spoke to Nicodemus, who now reappears at this uh, time. Jesus has been in Galilee for most of the last three years. As soon as Jesus came to Jerusalem, the religious leaders were ready to bring those old charges against him that he was a Sabbath breaker and a blasphemer. 
Last week we looked at how Jesus had appeared at the begin at the middle of the feast, not at the beginning. The first day of the feast, there was a lot of ceremony. It, the feast was actually seven days long, and it began with a holy convocation, a Sabbath day, and it ended with a Sabbath day. Then they added an eighth day to it. So at the end of this, you had another Sabbath, in effect. You had two consecutive Sabbaths, in effect. Now, the intervening days were not Sabbath days, but there was a lot of ritual and ceremony and temple observances. But it was a, something people took part in. It was a week-long celebration, and there was a lot of dinners with families, and there were a lot of visitors to Jerusalem. So in addition to the ceremonial part of it that occurred for the for first seven days, there was also a lot of, you know, celebrations going on. It was a, it was a time when you, you, you basically, it was a week-long celebration. John tells us something important in verse 37. He says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, the word day is just kind of added in a lot of translations. It's the last day, the great one of the feast the most important, because the ceremonies kind of came to their culmination on that last day. And it's a significant statement, one that gives the meaning of Christ's word. So this was likely the, the seventh day of the feast, because the eighth day was not technically part of the feast, it was just a Sabbath day after the feast. The, the Feast of Tabernacles w was a major celebration. We, as we mentioned last week, more foreigners from outside the area had came to this one because the, the weather was favorable to travel. It was in the fall. And it commemorated their dependence on God, not only in the past, but also in the present. And that's important to realize. Most of our holidays commemorate something that's over and done with, like Memorial Day, the 4th of July, commemorate something that's over and done with. They're not really forward-looking. All the Sabbaths were really forward-looking, as we'll, we'll discuss in a, in a moment. But the Feast of Tabernacles did commemorate the time in the wilderness, so they literally erected tents in their yards, or if they didn't have a yard, they would do it in the street, out in front, a small shelter, or they would put it up on their roof. It was like putting up your, your Christmas decorations. Uh, it was something everybody took part in, and it, wore, it was like almost a street fair where people were more in the street because of, they would often erect their booths there. So it was just a time where it was a lot of congestion, a lot of visitors, and all these temporary shelters like canopies would arise. And it was a co to commemorate the time when they lived in tents in the wilderness. But it was also to commemorate God's provision for them in the wilderness and when they were in the wilderness, this was a time of dependence on God, and they were waiting for God to fulfill the promise. The promise, and most obvious promise God was going to fulfill was giving them the land. Well, in the intervening years, God gave them a whole lot of other promises uh, of things that would happen. And we'll be talking about that here shortly. But the celebration lasted for seven days proper. And then an eighth day, as I said, was added as a Sabbath day after that. There was a great deal of ritual and ceremony that went into this uh, that focused on the uh, temple. The people themselves erected booths, and, or at least tents or huts, to represent their shelter in the wilderness. But the te temple rituals were kind of the, the focal center. Edersheim says that all of the orders of the priests took part. It was the only celebration where all of the different orders of the priests took part. He said at least 446 priests took part with a corresponding number of Levites. So this was a very involved celebration. And it wasn't just something that the priests did in the temple quietly and solemnly. The people surrounded the priests during this time in their ceremonies, and the people actually followed the priests and as they performed their duties. And, the, and uh, so it was, it was almost like a parade, a celebration in the streets. 
the unique part of the temple ceremonies, they did have sacrifices every day, but the unique part of the, this celebration was the carrying of water to the temple. Uh, and the, the, the feasts went outside the walls of Jerusalem to the Pool of Siloam, and they gathered water, they brought it back, the people accompanied them out in, the, you know, the, the way was lined with people, and they were, the people, it was tradition to carry a palm branch and fruit. The palm branch represented their temporary shelters and in the wilderness, and the fruit was the, the plenty of the land that, that God had given them. It, and they, these, this procession of priests, there were actually several processions, some of the priests actually would go out and gather branches and then come back and erect them in the temple, whereas others went to the Pool of Siloam and gathered this water in a golden pitcher. And they filled this pitcher and returned to the temple. And on their return to the temple, they went through a gate which was called the Water Gate. And that's why it was called the Water Gate, to, to represent because of its use in this uh, ceremony. The, peop the priests chanted what's called the Great Hallel. Hallel refers to the Hallelujah. It's praise. Hallelujah, Yah is the end of Hallelujah. Yah refers to God. Hallelujah means praise to God. And they recited this, what they could call the Great Hallel, uh, Great Praise, and quoting Psalms 113 and others. And as the priests and the Levites would chant the Psalms uh, one uh, line by line, the people would then repeat it. So this was something that it wasn't just that the priests did this in the temple in a very solemn thing. It was a very festive time, and the people very much were allowed to take part in it. When the priests with the water from the Pool of Siloam got to the temple, they were joined with to a priest who carried wine. The water represented the fact that in the wilderness, God had to provide water for them. It was their salvation. They would die without water. God provided that miraculously. And so the water represented the, the miracle of God's provision and the life that God gave them, the salvation that God gave them in, in the wilderness. And the wine represented the prosperity of the land that he had, in fact, brought them to. And both the water and the wine were poured into sort of a trumpet-shaped thing, and it went down around the base of the altar. Now, something that's important to remember is this the Feast of Tabernacles was not a memorial alone. It did take people back to a time when they had to anticipate God's provision. But even when they were in the wilderness, they were anticipating God's provision, God's future for them in the land. They were, so they were dependent upon God, but they were dependent, they were waiting for God to fulfill these promises of the land. But it also represented all the promises that the prophets had made about the future that were yet unfulfilled. Many of the messianic promises were yet unfulfilled. And I'd like to read a few of those um, references, and you see some of the significance that came to think, why would they pour water around the base of the altar? Isaiah 58, verse 11 says, and, and the Lord shall guide thee continually, and satisfy thy soul in drought, and make fat thy bones. And thou shalt be like a watered garden, and like a spring of water, whose waters fail not. And then, in Ezekiel 47, the I'd like to read the first 12 verses, the 12, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel 47, 1 through 12. This is a vision that God gave Ezekiel of a river of life flowing from the altar. And this is really what they were duplicating in this, um, this ceremony that they repeated all seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward, where the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under, from the right side of the house, 
at the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about to the way without unto the outer gate by the way that looketh eastward. And behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and waters were to the ankles. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters. The waters were to the knees. Again he measured a thousand and brought me through. The waters were to the loins. Afterward he measured a thousand, and it was a river that I could not pass over, for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. And when I had returned, behold, the bank of the river was, were very many trees on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that, that liveth, that moveth, whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from and Gedi, even unto Engeiam, and they shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea, exceeding many. But the miry places thereof, and the marshes thereof, shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. And by the river upon the banks thereof, and on this side and on that side, shall grow all trees for meat, whose leaves shall not fade, neither shall the fruit thereof be consumed. It shall bring forth new fruit according to his months, because their waters they issued out of the sanctuary, and the fruit thereof shall be for meat, and the leaf thereof for medicine. The analogy there is that in the vision Ezekiel had of the temple, waters were flowing from the, the altar, and they were going out. As they went out, they got deeper and deeper. At first it was ankle deep, then it was, you know, higher. Finally, it was a river he couldn't even swim across. This represented the blessings of God and the promises of God that flow from his temple increasing until they multiplied and created life. It's, it's an image of the kingdom of God and the grace of God going out and his promises being fulfilled. And that's the image of the water coming from the temple. Incidentally, the Parenthetically, uh, something that was pointed, my dad pointed out to me almost 40 years ago now, is that in Sacramento there's a building with a quote from this passage in Ezekiel. If you are on I-5, yes. just past Old Town, before Richard Avenue, if you look to the right, this time of year the leaves are falling off the trees and you'll probably be able to see it. But towards the right, there's a public works building. It's actually a, a the water district or some, some, you know, the water company that supplies water to Sacramento. And it's a sort of a Greek revival building. And they have an inscription on the top. And it's, it's a paraphrase of Ezekiel 47, 9. Everything shall live whither the river cometh. And you can see that in both lines, and you can see that right from the freeway. Um, and that's a testament to a, a very different America, or, you know, 100 years ago or so, 80 or 100 years ago when that building was uh, built. But they, they secularized that because obviously water is very important to California. But the meaning is really about the kingdom of God going forth and watering dry places. Then there, uh, one more passage in Zechariah 14.8, many years after Ezekiel, we read, and it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be. Here's waters flowing in different directions, not just the course of the Jordan River to the Dead Sea, as in Ezekiel, but waters flowing in both directions, even upstream. In other words, these, these living waters will go out from Jerusalem. 
So those are the context of this ceremony that took place involving the priests. The Jews knew that the fullness of these promises had never been realized. When Jesus preached the kingdom of heaven, it was associated with the messianic era and these promises. So, the historical context of the Feast of Tabernacles was the people in the wilderness waiting for the, God's future promise, which at that time was the promised land. But the future context was the era that these prophets had spoken of, which in our Lord's day were still future. And so the Feast of Tabernacles wasn't just passed bound. It wasn't just a memorial. It was about all the good things that are going to, God's going to do that's going to come out of Jerusalem. Now back to the feast itself. The water ritual went on for seven days. On the seventh, the priests would actually circle the altar. When they brought the water in, they would circle the altar seven times the number of times they circled Jericho. And what was did Jericho represent? The certain victory that God had promised. In other words, the promises of God, we're going to circle the altar with this life-giving water, and we're going to pour it from the altar because God's promised these waters are going to gush from the altar, and it's going to change everything and create abundant life. And then on the eighth day, the, the, the feast ended, and there was no water ceremony. This eighth day really represented their rest. The fact that God had, in fact, fulfilled promises. They were in the land, and so some of God's promises had been filled. God was faithful, so they rested on that day. And God no longer had to provide them with water because he had brought them into the land. But there were still other promises unfulfilled represented by the water. So... Still, the larger promises, though, the, living, the larger promise of this living water that would flow out and get deeper and deeper was unfulfilled. So the Feast of Tabernacles was about the past, but it was also future-oriented. It looked forward to the great things that God would do. Now, we're told by John, then, that this was the last day of the feast. People differed whether that was the seventh day or the eighth day. Edersheim, I think, is probably correct when he says it, the last day refers to the seventh day. Because the eighth day was really not part of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was an added Sabbath uh, after the festivities were over. Sabbath rest is not just an arbitrary observance. And it wasn't just about an observance of the past. There are three historical examples of the Sabbath rest in Scripture, and none were strictly a memorial. All involved a present rest in terms, because man can rest in, in terms of the assurance that God is going to do something in the future. God has set the stage for something greater in the future. In Genesis 2 and Exodus 20, the reference of the Sabbath is to God's creation rest. And what are we celebrating? That God made the world, he has a future for it. We rest in terms of what God has done, God is our creator, and therefore we rest in terms of what he has done. And so we're to remember that fact. And this is why creation is an important doctrine. God centered one of his commandments on it and told man, you remember I'm the creator. One day in the week you're supposed to rest, remember I'm the creator. But that's not the only historical basis for the Sabbath he gave us. In Deuteronomy 5 we have another historical example. He says, I saved you from Egyptian slavery. What did he save him? Just from something? No, it was saved. I saved you to something. I promised you a land. I promised you a future and future blessings. So God's salvation event regarding the Exodus was a past event that gave them a context for their future life. And many of our, our Psalter selections refer to this time in the wilderness and how God provided them and he saved them from their enemies. 
The Feast of Tabernacles was, was very much about this salvation that God showed them in their time in the wilderness after the exodus and before he brought them into the land. There's a third historical basis this for the Sabbath. Hebrews 4 calls Christ our Sabbath rest. Again, we don't just memorialize what Christ did because what Christ did represents our present and is certainly a future orientation. It gives us a context for our future. Well, so these, the Sabbath rest and these, all these, this Feast of Tabernacles and the other feasts didn't just represent a memorial for what God had done in the past. It was about God, what God was still going to do for them in the future. Jesus came to the temple then on this last day, the great day of the feast, John calls it. This was the culmination of the celebration. In verse 37, John says, Jesus stood and cried. He stood. Now, he was not teaching if he was standing. Because normally if you were teaching, and remember the temple complex was large and there were these porticos, these covered walkways, and they were quite large and quite extensive. And if he was off teaching a group of people, he would be seated. But it says he stood. This was not a teaching. This was an announcement. This was a proclamation. And we're, said, we're told he cried. This is the same word for cried that we saw last week in verse 28. It means he said it in a loud voice with emphasis. Early, in the middle of the feast, he'd gotten up and cried. And now he's doing it again. He's announcing something. And, and what he announces in verses 37 and 38, he says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. You see the reference to those passages and the, and the living water and the ceremony that had culminated on the great day of the feast? So the, the major thing that was happening on that day was this final day of this carrying of the water, the pouring it out of the ark of the, on, around the altar to represent the, the, the promises of God flowing forth and expanding as Ezekiel had described them. He's, he even uses the same term that we find in his Zechariah 14.8, living water. And here this water ceremony is going on and the people are, are, are following the priests and Jesus cried in a loud voice, it's about me. <laughs> he said, if you want, if you're thirsty, I'm your source for living water. Wow. He was really co-opting this, the whole week-long celebration by saying this in a loud voice in the temple. You see why they hated him? I mean, you wouldn't like any uh, proof of, you know, somebody coming in here and interrupting a service that you thought should have you know, solemnity to it. He interrupted what they were doing, or perhaps Edersheim thought, after the culmination, he announced to the people, believe on me, and rivers of living water will flow from you. He was really quoting perhaps Isaiah 12, 3 and 4, which says, therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation, and in that day shall ye say, praise the Lord, Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. Now, John, remember, is writing years later, and he immediately explains what Jesus meant in verse 39. He says Jesus was referring to the Holy Spirit. That is the living waters that, are, that will flow out of those who believe in him. Jesus just co-opted a week-long celebration in a week-long series of celebrations and you could just imagine the seething hatred of the temple <coughs> officials we're all told that some believed that jesus was of god he was a prophet some said he's the christ but others said no he's just a galilean and we know that jesus has to come from bethlehem well, also some wanted him arrested 
verse 45, the temple officers reported to the chief priests and Pharisees. We're not given the details here. If they had issued an arrest warrant for Jesus at this point, and they would have had to, you can't just go arrest somebody unless the Sanhedrin ordered them arrested. But if they ordered him arrested, it was illegal because they were doing it on a Sabbath. And they weren't allowed to do that. Later in the crucifixion, they broke their own rules. Remember that Jesus was tried at night in secret? That was against their rules. So, apparently these people weren't afraid of breaking the rules or selectively applying them. They considered what Jesus said to be blasphemy. Remember earlier when he was, the last time we're told the, specifically and given an incident when he was in Jerusalem, um, after the healing at the Pool of Bethesda, he said, uh, he referred to God as his father and they accused him of blasphemy. Now in effect he's doing the same thing. So they're saying, here he goes again. So they were ready to arrest him. Paul would repeat this reference in 1 Corinthians 10.4 when he spoke of Christ as the spiritual rock from which they drank. And of course that goes back to the time in the wilderness when waters came out of the rock. Now, let's stop here for a minute and notice that John in his gospel has made a lot of references to the wilderness period and he's saying Christ is a fulfillment of all these things. Notice in John 2, we're, we were told that he is the true temple. John 3, he is the brazen serpent that Moses erected in the wilderness. In John 6, he's called the bread from heaven. In here in John 7, he is the source of living water. Later in, in John 8, he will be referred to as the pillar of fire. And John 19, he is the Passover lamb. So the whole Exodus wilderness history was pointing to Jesus Christ. And this is something that the people fully understand. It was just part of, of who they were that they had been slaves in Egypt. So this time in the wilderness, it was part of the Feast of Tabernacles. It was part of their consciousness of who they were. So Jesus says, that's all fulfilled in me. And he stood in the temple at the culmination of this great feast and he cried. He spoke in a loud voice saying, I am your source of living water. The temple officers sent to arrest Jesus had to report back to the chief priests and Pharisees. The only reason that um, these priests and Pharisees would have had an official role at this point in order to have these men appoint, um, report to them was if they were members of the Sanhedrin. So this is an official attempt to prosecute Jesus by the Sanhedrin. And the men, the officers who were sent to arrest Jesus by the Sanhedrin had failed to do so. And they had to report back to the superiors. From the perspective of the Sanhedrin, they had a lousy excuse. They said, why didn't you arrest him as you were told to? And he said, never man spake like this man. I'm, as I said last week, I don't think that was just the words that Jesus said. It was his authority. Jesus was speaking as God. Remember what he had said a few days earlier? He said, where I am, thither ye cannot come. Now, that was present tense. You can't touch me. I'm not ready for you to touch me yet. And John included this. Really, it's a testament from uh, non-sympathizers with Jesus that they couldn't touch him. They, they were sent to do a job, and it was not easy for them to report back that they couldn't do it, but they just said we couldn't do it. And the closing scene here in John 7 is one of discord and frustration. They've been unable to arrest Jesus. The Pharisees in verse 42 accused the officers of being deceived like the ignorant peasants that believed in Jesus. They said, look at us. Do you see any of us believing in him? Wouldn't we know if this was the Messiah? 
They even cursed those who believed as lawbreakers. Now, in what sense were they lawbreakers? That's kind of a leap of logic. But it was an accusation. It's like some, calling someone a racist. It's not whether they're really racist. It's the fact that that's just a good way to hit them in a sense of the spot and to bring up a charge that is very, very serious. So they just called all the people who believed in Jesus uh, as lawbreakers. <coughs> what laws they were referring to isn't at all clear. They were basically defying the, the... These men were seeing themselves as the source of the law. They de he defies our opinions, our leadership, therefore he's a lawbreaker by definition. They didn't need to be specific. They didn't even need to use logic. Coming from the religious leaders, being a lawbreaker was a very serious offense. One voice of opposition was raised. It was by Nicodemus, the man that Jesus had spoken to at night, the last time he's recorded as being in Jerusalem, several years earlier. Verse 50 says, Nicodemus was one of them. That is, he was one of the Sanhedrin. And Nicodemus urged against a rush to condemn Jesus. He wanted G the Sanhedrin to give Jesus a fair hearing. In other words, he deserves due process, is what he was saying. You've already condemned him. You say he's guilty, but there's been no due process. Well, the decision, obviously, had already been made, and Nicodemus recognized that. They decided that Jesus was not of God. He was not the Messiah. And he, therefore, he did not deserve a hearing. The religious leaders saw themselves as the custodians of truth. So they'd already decided that Jesus did not deserve a hearing. And they dismissed Nicodemus's appeal. And they suggested sarcastically that maybe Nicodemus was a Galilean too. So that's why he sympathized with Jesus. You're just one of those nobodies from Galilee, perhaps, and maybe is that why you sympathize with him? Jesus was a Galilean, so they assumed, therefore, he was a nobody. And he couldn't be the Messiah. So we're told some of the people believe that, too, that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah because he wasn't from Bethlehem. Jesus didn't go around giving his credentials and his, his resume out so that people would believe him based upon the, where he was born. The religious leaders were certain End of story. With that false supposition that it was impossible for him to be the Messiah, they went home. Note the statement in verse 52 that no prophet came out of Galilee. Well, technically that was true, but that doesn't... But they were actually overlooking a passage that might very likely have applied to Jesus. In fact, it did. Isaiah 9, verse 1 actually refers to Galilee. And the very next verse in Isaiah 9, 2 is the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. We always apply that to Jesus. So that Isaiah 9 was a reference to, to Jesus and the Messiah in Galilee. And what we quote even more often is in verse 6 of Isaiah 9, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. So there was a reference to the Messiah in connection with Galilee, however, vaguely in Isaiah 9. And they didn't recognize that. Now, we quote Isaiah 9, 6 all the time. You'll see it how many times on Facebook or Christmas cards in the next few weeks. This was a clear call of Jesus to believe. He was announcing who he was. In, in effect, he was publicly announcing Believe not just in my miracles, not just in the words that I speak, but you have to believe in me personally. If you believe in me, living water will come from you. Remember, Jesus at the end of his Galilean ministry, just a short time earlier, had said he was the bread of life. He was God's manna sent from heaven. Now even more clearly, he says, believe in him. will bring living waters that were represented in the ceremonies at the Feast of Tabernacles. 
Belief in him was the step towards the fulfillment of those promises that they celebrated every year at the Feast of Tabernacles. He announced this in a loud voice in the temple. He cried it. Offering living water was not a vague spiritual symbolism. And that's what, uh, you know, a pietistic Christianity takes it for. It's just some vague reference that we just pull that meaning of living water out of thin air. It had an Old Testament meaning. They had just poured water out on the base of the temple. And Jesus said, if you want living water, you come to me. It was a reference to the promises of God to spread his kingdom and his blessings far and wide so that it would become so broad you couldn't swim across it. This is what the ritual of the water represented. Jesus said, if you want that, believe in me. Those blessings are now flowing, and that kingdom has grown, and that kingdom is still growing. Those waters are still flowing outward, but they only come through Jesus Christ. And to enjoy those waters, we have to believe in him. Let's pray. Our most good and gracious God and Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us understand the living waters that, that your kingdom represents. That they're not just our personal living water, but that, that these living waters flow out of us and out of your people, out of your, uh, your church, your kingdom will flow living waters. And we, we thank you that your living waters now extend to all parts of the world. We thank you that your kingdom is growing. We look forward not just to future growth, in the terms of the numbers of people, but we particularly long to see the growth of your kingdom in its influence in the public sphere. And we know that the, the forces of evil can be cast down at the slightest little uh, problem, that we see men of great power and influence suddenly thrown down and, and, and abandoned by their own peers. And we, we know that that can happen. We know that policies can change very, very quickly and you can change these policies, and that you could advance your kingdom uh, overnight. And we long to see that time, and we're frustrated at times when your kingdom is, doesn't advance further. And we particularly pray for our faithfulness. We pray that you would create more and more people in your kingdom who are willing to fight for it and to live in terms of it as, as, as citizens of your kingdom. Help us to be faithful citizens of your kingdom so you can advance it in and through us and our families. We ask now that you would you would bless us as we seek to do this in this coming week. In Christ our Savior's name. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 595.